Thank you. Thank you, men. Such a delight to be with you this morning. Back at it with Kindred, uh, a church I truly love, my family loves. My family is not with me on this trip as in past trips, but uh, truly a joy to be back and to be with you and think together about consequential things. Thank you so much to Pastor Philip and the pastoral team here, men of iron all, and I pray that this is a blessing to you, this conference and this session. The Maginot Line was built in several phases from 1930 by French forces. The main construction was completed by 1939 at a cost of around 3 billion French francs. The Maginot Line was composed of an intricate system of strong points, fortifications, military facilities, border guard posts, communication centers, infantry shelters, barricades, artillery, machine gun, and anti-tank emplacements, and on it goes. The most impressive part of the Maginot Line of the French in the pre-World War II era were the fortresses. These were composed of at least six forward bunker systems, and they were connected via a network of tunnels that were specially constructed for the Maginot Line. There were around 500 to 1,000 men who would man each of these fortresses, all built because there was a threat right on the French border, the growing Nazi menace. The Maginot Line was impressive. It bristled with military power. There was just one problem. It was not suited to the threat at hand. It was fitted for a different challenge, an age of warfare when armies would stand opposite one another and battle it out until one side capitulated. Why talk about the Maginot Line? Well, I do love military history, I admit. We're talking about it because our theology today, I sense, is not adapted to one of the major challenges of our time. Brothers, there is a threat. There is a threat to every person, and there is a real threat and growing danger to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are not thus far as a movement of Christians showing much awareness of it or ability to handle it. What do, what do I mean? Many of us have heard of postmodernism. You've gone to conferences, you've read books, you've certainly heard it discussed. But what you're likely familiar with, what we all are to a degree, is what we call soft postmodernism. This is the view that there is no objective truth, there's no ought in life. Everyone does what is right in his own eyes. Science tells us what we need to know about God, and atheists dominate generally in this context. Well, that was a big threat 10 to 20 years ago to the church. But the threat has shifted. We are now dealing with what you could call hard postmodernism. This is a very strongly argued argument. There's a clear good group and bad group. And science actually now is increasingly seen, like all use of reason, the ability to think, as racist. America is increasingly divided because of hard postmodernism into categories of racist and anti-racist. Many of us, therefore, are equipped for the older threat, the older form of warfare where the primary challenge our young people, for example, were going to face in going to college or university was going to be the belief that there is no objective truth. Things have shifted. Now, the prevailing belief out there is that there absolutely is an objective standard of racism and our history as a society does not live up to it, and we ourselves are not living up to it. All this leads then to us identifying the threat on our borders, one of the foremost challenges the church faces today. Wokeness. Wokeness. In what follows, I want to define wokeness in part one. You have your hand out there to guide us in this blistering little tour this morning, and then I intend to critique it. And I am doing so because we, as men of God, men of Christ, want to understand the times. And again, this is a major challenge in our time that few are identifying and even fewer are speaking to. As we move into this session, let's do so with Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, ringing in our ears. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. 
for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Recall what we are doing then as we move ahead. This will be more of a kind of teaching section than an exposition of Scripture. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be preaching from Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. That will be a scriptural exposition. This is more going to be teaching about a system and critiquing it, but in, in doing so, we are trying to take every thought captive, every thought we have about image-bearing race, ethnicity, and so on. What we are doing, therefore, is cultural deconstruction. We are analyzing an unbiblical system as we must do, per Paul's words just now, destroy arguments. You may never have heard this talked about much in the Christian church. This isn't always playing on your local radio station or something like this, but this is directly biblical work, what we're about to do, in order that we may do gospel reconstruction and rebuild a Christian worldview in all its beauty and glory and health. Part one, what wokeness is. Let's move into this. Wokeness is first and foremost a mindset and a posture. The term itself means that one is awake to the true nature of the world where so many are asleep. In the most specific terms, this means that you see the comprehensive inequity of our social order and the corresponding need for racial and social justice. In intellectual terms, wokeness advances when you embrace a system of thought that is very popular right now in the academy and American government, in our culture writ large, called critical race theory. Critical race theory teaches that all of societal life is structured along racial power dynamics. Race, according to CRT theorists, is a social construct. That means that it's not biologically based, it's not based in reality, it exists in our imagination, and yet it is America's original lie that has led to America's original sin, racism. Racism occurs when one racial group oppresses, dehumanizes, and demeans others. And this, according to woke theorists and activists, is what white people do, according to them. According to wokeness, the personal is structural and the structural is personal. America was and is shot through with racism. The specific terms capturing this reality are structural racism, racism and systemic racism. It's not only that individuals could say or do racist things, it's that the entire civilizational order is infected top to bottom, roots to branches with racism. And this flows directly from our country's origins. Originally, America was set up, was rigged to be a power game that only white people would win. Slavery and Jim Crow perpetuated such inequity. Then and now, white people think of themselves as superior to black people, according to critical race theory and people of other races or skin colors. While whiteness is a mentality, it is predominantly believed and practiced by white, in air quotes, people. Such people benefit from a system grounded in white supremacy and promote it all the time. White supremacy is always functioning in America according to the woke. It's occurring at the unintentional level. It's, in, it's occurring at the systemic level as well. Differences in our culture and society are read straightforwardly by woke theorists and activists in monocausal terms, one cause only, racism. The reason, in other words, why there is inequity in America of varying kinds, to put this more simply, is because of racism, is because of white people, is because of white people, not, not the racist ones, not the ethnocentrist ones, all white people. All white people perpetuate white supremacy all the time. You can't help it. Please understand, 
It's not something you opt into. It's not something you decide to do. You don't wake up and decide to partake of a white supremacist system. You partake of it by virtue of your skin color. Moving to our next section, we have seen the enemy, and it is color blindness. The enemy of anti-racism, which is the only solution there is to racism, is as much color blindness as it is racial oppression of an intentional kind. What do I mean? A lot of us grew up in a public school context or a schooling situation where we heard the stirring tones of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches, for example, at the very least informed by Protestant theology. Well, MLK is actually one who is sharply criticized by the woke. Many of us not necessarily agreeing with King on all counts to be sure, not even seeing him as an evangelical, which he didn't confess himself in his lifetime, and yet seeing some resonances of the biblical truth of the image of God, for example, and wanting a society, very much wanting a society, many of us, tons of us, tons of Christians, where people are not judged by how they look, by the color of their skin. Horrors. What a sinful, wicked thought, but by the content of their character. But that is not the answer according to the woke. Color blindness is not the goal. A society where children are judged by their character, not their skin color, is no longer the goal in the leading vanguard of the woke. Ibram X. Kendi is perhaps the leading woke scholar today. If you go to your local Barnes & Noble, there, there are stacks of books by Kendi. Ibram X. Kendi is Probably his best known one right now is How to Be an Anti-Racist, where he walks through in his own form what I am talking about this morning. He has said this, the most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right's unlikely drive for a white ethnostate, but the regular American's drive for a race-neutral one. Do you understand? Do you understand how significant a statement that is? The biggest problem before us are not actual white supremacists. According to Kendi, who has a professorship at Boston University, speaks all over the country, gets tens of thousands of dollars for 30 minutes on a Zoom session to talk about this material, I mean just stratospherically popular right now. According to him, the biggest problem is the normal American citizen. Somebody who just is trying to live their life in general terms, be a good neighbor, be kind to others, not judge people by their skin color, all these sorts of things that, frankly, not just a lot of people in Christian circles, but in common grace terms, lots of people around here are trying to do. Are we, are we whitewashing? No, there's real racist and ethnocentrist sin out there, isn't there? There is. We'll talk about that. Some of you may have experienced it. Some of us may have committed such sins. We're, we're not shy about that confession. The gospel frees us to be radically honest, doesn't it, about our failings and our sins. And men have to actually lead in that kind of gospel honesty, don't we? And yet, and yet, your average person, this is a massive claim, is walking around effectively as a white supremacist, especially if they have white skin color. This is a tremendously explosive and divisive claim. Moving to the next section, anti-racism is the way forward. I said this earlier, the only way, according to Kendi and others, that we can overcome our inherent racism, especially as white people, is by becoming an anti racist. To become an anti-racist means that you commit to a complete personal and social revolution that is akin to a kind of secular conversion experience. So your kids who are going to local universities and colleges that are, that are secular, that are not Christian, will very likely in different classes encounter this kind of ideology. Bet on it if you send them there. I'm not saying it's wrong to necessarily, just know this is what they will hear. This is the new vanguard of academic thought. The system of white supremacy that used to dominate America and still dominates it just the same way it did in the age of slavery and Jim Crow, 
must fall. The way it falls is by aggressive and sweeping action at every level to reimagine America as an anti-racist society. Common proposals include reparations for descendants of slaves to the tune of billions of dollars, restructuring of hiring to ensure diverse personnel, protest and opposition, even with violence if necessary, to racist entities and individuals, re-education of youth to show the systemic wickedness of America as a country. Ibram Kendi has a book that you can get at Barnes & Noble, How to Raise an Anti-Racist Baby. You might have thought that a little baby, not making this up, crawling around, we've got a nursery here, yes, on campus, those little babies in there, tomorrow, when they're dropped off by their parents, or if they are indeed, oh man, I'm pre-COVID here, here, aren't I? Okay, well, the babies, wherever they may be, okay, dropped off or not, mom's arms or in the nursery, are racist from birth and need to be trained. Babies, are you tracking here? need to be trained in how to be an anti-racist. Babies. Babies. We also need to do the practice of lament, personally confessing our inherent racism, especially if white, and then we need to enact acts of secular repentance. This is indeed a salvific system. There's no ultimate salvation in this system, but this is a system of atonement for sin. Do not misunderstand, and it will and is taking people captive. It all rests on what is called critical theory. There's a huge conversation to have here. We are condensing things massively here, and yet critical theory was used by Marxists, okay, uh, 80 to 100 years ago, to argue that all society and culture was structured in terms of power dynamics, not racial, but economic. So a major threat to the West in the last hundred years in different places and times has been economic Marxism, such that people would try to foment big government and force it on people who, in many cases, do not want it, want the opposite of it. And then society would be radically restructured, uh, profits and one's earning would be reappropriated by the state and distributed by the state. You're familiar with some of these ideas, I'm sure. Critical race theory uses critical theory. It argues, yes, that there are these evil power dynamics at play everywhere at all times in this society, but they're not economic, they're racial. You understand the point? So racism, this is how racism becomes a, a, a totalizing theory. You see everything through it, everywhere you look, you cannot help but see racist power dynamics and the failings of America and America as a wicked system and America as a country that does not deserve our support, deserves our censure, and on and on it goes. And many of you, to some degree, are, are resistant to that. But our children, in particular, are being baptized in this. They're being led down to the river and baptized, and they don't even know they are. They don't even know what these terms are. We're out here trying to raise anti-racist babies, and people don't even know it. In CRT, critical race theory, life is a zero-sum game, and white people need to start losing. This is all very philosophical, though. Woke ideology isn't made to stay in the classroom, just like Marxism. It's made for the streets. It's made for revolutions. And we have witnessed one in America in recent months under the banner of Black Lives Matter and Antifa along with it. While not all critical race theorists or activists would commend violence in the public square, the movement assembled around Black Lives Matter includes numerous voices that do promote social destruction of various kinds and physical violence where necessary. The official BLM platform, as I'll go on to talk about in just a few minutes, opposes the nuclear family, endorses LGBT identity in extreme terms, and uh, paints the police and authorities as innately, inherently corrupt. I believe we'll be hearing about that in just a little bit. Praise God. Under the banner of protest of police brutality, a complex subject deserving careful analysis 
and cool-minded handling. Activists in numerous cities, one after another, you saw the news just as I did. You saw the social media, fire up your social media in the morning at work or whatever it may be at home, doing your job from at home, and you're seeing what? Videos of activists torching property, attacking counter-protesters, and murdering different individuals in the name of justice, all under the banner of justice. In St. Louis, just four hours from where I live, teach at Midwestern, Kansas City, St. Louis, an African-American police chief, David Dorn, tried to hold back the mob in St. Louis, which was running amok, and was shot and killed. An African-American man who had lived a, a good life in, in common terms and had contributed greatly to his community and was African-American. I repeat myself, it did, it did nothing. It meant nothing. You see, he was standing against justice. What a twisting of a word that is, that you would murder a man in cold blood and call it justice. God's own word, God's own character. One of the attributes of God is that he is perfectly just and he will have his justice. It looks like justice is delayed now. It is not delayed. It is being stored up like water, and it will break out on the last day, and no one will escape. And that reality is meant to unsettle and even terrify every last one of us. Christianity does not start, when you're thinking through its system anyway, in a place of extreme comfort, as if God just loves us like the great grandfather in the sky and turns a blind eye to every evil we do. No, Christianity starts from God's perfect divine justice, His just justice, under which we are all condemned. It's not that some are and some aren't. We're all condemned. We're all deserving of eternal damnation in hell, not just separation from God, the just, conscious torment of sinners like us. That is what we deserve. Those are the terms in which justice comes. God is the one who will execute perfect justice. No one is getting away. It may look like they are, they are not. Now, not every BLM activist or person who would retweet a, a BLM hashtag or something like this stands for violence. Nonetheless, we cannot miss where this thinking, where wokeness has gone in the last several months in this country. I just spoke a version of this talk and several more last weekend in Minnetonka, eight miles from Minneapolis. Christianity and Wokeness, it's on YouTube if you want to watch more of this material from me. I did it a week ago. Christianity and Wokeness, one to two billion dollars of damage in Minneapolis, way more than the LA riots in 1992, according to different voices. One to two billion dollars of damage. There is much that will never reopen in Minneapolis, which is a beautiful city. As John MacArthur has rightly said, after nearly a decade of relentless indoctrination in this system, the result has been an explosion of ethnic animosity and civic unrest. This is a worldview, the woke worldview, that deliberately foments and feeds on resentment, strife, hatred, and division. Last section here before part two, intersectionality. What is intersectionality? I hope you're getting your money's worth here this morning. My wife tells me I am fire hosey, technical term. I, I, have tr I, tr I gave you the handout, man. You, you got to give me a little grace for that at least, okay? I'm trying. What is intersectionality? We've already got a lot on the table, don't we? Let's press in. Let's do this. We have to do this. We have to understand the times. To have one's eyes open to one's racism, as I have said, is the great awakening that CRT seeks. Just like Chris Christians want a great awakening, it's just a secular form. But when you become woke, you not only become an anti-racist, 
you also become one who sees power dynamics everywhere in society. And you see them wherever there are different positions, uh, wherever there are supposed inequities. Someone has a higher pay scale. Uh, s someone has more power. Someone has more influence. You're not just seeing a, a different situation because of life calling and talent and background and these sorts of things. You're seeing intersectional injustice. What does this mean? It means that all over the place are underprivileged peoples, peoples who don't have privilege in many different ways. And what we should wake up to see is that there are many people who have intersectional concerns. For example, they are a black, lesbian, feminist woman. In intersectional thinking, those are four different categories in which this person lacks privilege. So what we should do is we should restructure society to make it equal so that there are no distinctions or differences. Now that may sound okay on the face of it, but an intersectional worldview, when you actually scratch it a little bit, has very significant thinking indeed. First, men oppress women. Men, by virtue of having more strength, uh, more power, oppress women. And anywhere there is a context, for example, like the church, where men would be called, based on creation order, God actually historically making the man before the woman, and then calling men to leadership in the home and in the church accordingly, where you see a difference in calling and role. You understand the point? You're not seeing something divine that puts God's glory on display, as Gavin will be talking about in just a few minutes. No, 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 no. You're seeing oppression. You're seeing toxic masculinity predominate. Toxic masculinity is not just when somebody goes off the handle and hurts others as a man. Toxic masculinity can be swapped in for masculinity. Even an event like this, honestly, guys, is basically retrograde in our culture right now. For us to talk about manhood and define this and call men to be strong in Jesus Christ and fight their sin and protect women and love their children is not positive. It's sexism. It leads to oppression. Now, we'll note with our doctrine of sin, it can. Christian men aren't perfect. What does James say? We all stumble in many ways. We all know our flaws and failings. And again, we're called to be honest about them and confess them and repent of them before the Lord. And yet, fundamentally, men oppress women just by virtue of these structures. Intellectuals, next category, use the construct of reason to oppress minority groups in the academy. Reason is a Western construct that has been used intellectually to oppress minority groups, again, in the academy. Certainly, we're familiar with this one. The rich fundamentally oppress the poor. Our culture really believes this. I, I, I trust you know this. At least the leading edge of it does. That if you have a lot more money than others, right? Salary inequity. If there's a CEO who is making $10 million a year and there is an employee who is making $22,000 a year, circumstances and background and training and sacrifice are not taken into account by this kind of worldview. That is a sign of inequity, and inequity is oppression. So the system of capitalism is an oppressive system that needs to be dismantled. And if you have $29.99, you can buy books that will tell you how to do that. The <laughs> irony, irony. Think of, think, think of driving home, turn off the radio and just sit there and think about that one for a few minutes. <laughs> Cops oppress citizens. This is part of what has been behind the massive wave of unrest fundamentally against the blue. The blue being one of the most integrated forces and, and social groups, if you will, in the West. Police being actually, on average, pretty integrated as a force. No, 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 no. Cops fundamentally oppress others because they have power citizens don't have, which breeds 
extreme distrust, which is the mindset of many, many people in our society. Are cops perfect? No. No, 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 no. They need Jesus, like us all. And yet, do you understand how we're approaching cops not from a position of common grace trust, you see this, but from a position of absolute distrust, believing that they are out to oppress me fundamentally. Physically able people oppress physically disabled people. This is called ableism, ableism. In, in fact, disabled people are encouraged now to make their disability their identity and even not to seek treatment and healing. This is identity politics coming to disabled people who, who need care and treatment and help, like we all do at different points. But no, 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 they are made an oppressed group. Though you wouldn't know, you wouldn't necessarily think you're oppressing disabled people by being physically able and functioning in a physically able way. No, no that, that's why there are now so many disabled parking spaces when you go to Target. It's a good thing that there would be a whole bunch. Good. But that's why there are seemingly so many. It, honestly, it's because of a, a push against the oppression of ableism. This is, this is influencing every level of society, including the parking lot. Cisgender and heteronormative straight people oppress sexual minorities of the LGBT kind. I won't spell that out. That's coming up in our next session. Adults oppress children. If you have more power than your kids have, you're oppressing them. You should expect to see this one rise and rise and rise in days ahead. When you go out in public, are kids in general uh, displaying a submissive attitude, to dad and mom. <laughs> You're already laughing. Okay. We get this one, don't we? It's already a battle, isn't it? For all of us, fathers and mothers aren't perfect. We need Christ, and children need Christ, and we fail in many ways, all of us. And yet, this is a system that is taking people captive, and it is training kids to see their parents as fundamentally their oppressor. All this means, then, that intersectional justice demands that we totally dismantle this society and culture. Please understand that this is not just little bits and pieces here and there of leftism. This is a bigger system, and it's a system, I believe, wokeness, that is driven by nothing less than Satan himself, ultimately. It is anti-God, it is anti-Bible, and as we will see now as we move rapid-fire fashion into part two, anti gospel. First, let's talk about nine different critiques of wokeness in blisteringly quick fashion. Nine different problems. We've laid out the system. We're actually trying to respect the system. Do you understand? We're not just judging everybody quickly and, and consigning them to the trash bin. We actually walked through their thought. I've taken some time to do that. That's a show of respect, even though I don't agree with, with wokeness as a system. Now I need to double-click and lock in and critique it, and then we dip. First, wokeness tweaks the doctrine of humanity. It loses sight of the image of God. The image of God from Genesis 1 and 2 means that every man and woman, boy and girl of whatever level, uh, intellectually, physical ability, is one who has dignity and worth. The baby in the womb, kicking around in mom's tummy, is an image bearer. The person coming to the end of their life, man or woman in a nursing home who cannot even feed themselves, cannot even go to the restroom by themselves, has dignity as the image of God. This is what Christian theology teaches and our society is discarding. Wokeness does not affirm the image of God. It does not see humanity as fundamentally grounded together as the image bearer. It argues instead that we are fundamentally divided. Secondly, that leads into our second point. Wokeness judges an entire group of people as guilty of white supremacy simply for being white. Now, there is no biblical word that says this, and that matters first and foremost to Scripture people like those represented by this church and many churches out here in California. We are Bible people. And we care, first and foremost, what the Bible says. And the Bible does not say that white people specifically and specially are an extra bad category 
of sinner. It is true that people with white skin color have in the American past done terrible things to others and have more broadly beyond this country. That is true, and we're not shy about that. And if you want to hear me handle some of our our history, racism, and ethnocentrism, you can tune into those Christianity and wokeness lectures on YouTube. I did one on history that I can't go into now because of time, but I I handle it. And I'm trying to be honest about real sin and real failing, not just on the part of so-called white people, but on the part of the church. Our, Our past has tragic flaws and failings here. Nonetheless, with that said, whiteness is not indicative of white supremacy. If you're a white person, you are not innately a white supremacist. You could be. You could commit sins along those lines. Absolutely you could. We all have the seeds of such sin in us, and yet you are not inherently guilty of racism as a white person. If you have ever been told that, be released from it today. Claim afresh the power of the gospel and know that you are not extra specially guilty because of your skin color. The scripture does not teach this. Third, wokeness denies the reality of creation order and the goodness of God's design. The intersectional worldview denies that there is such a thing as creation order, that God has made the sexes for his glory, that there are distinct roles and duties among men and women that it is a beautiful thing to be manly in the gospel, and it is a beautiful thing to be feminine in the gospel, that it is a beautiful thing for a mother to to love her children and nurture them and be a homemaker and these sorts of things that our society now hates and scorns and mocks. These are beautiful realities in the biblical mind, but wokeness is not friendly to biblical complementarity. Wokeness reads difference as discrimination, and there are numerous evangelicals and Baptists, in terms of my context, who are making intersectional arguments and saying that men being pastors and elders of the local church and the shepherd and teacher of the local church in elder form, that is a sexist reality. There are major names out there that you would know and your wives would know that are making these claims inside the camp. Wokeness is here. It's in many schools. It's in many evangelical universities, it's in many churches, and it is zero hour. Fourth, wokeness foments, creates the very sin it presumes to critique, racism. Just as this worldview makes you hate men if you follow it logically, so it honestly makes you at the very least distrust and probably very much dislike and stereotype right off the bat white people. You think you know someone, according to this worldview, by virtue of their skin color. Is there a worse idea than that? Do you know me? Do you know my background? Do you know that I'm from a a mixed ethnicity home? Would you think that looking at me, hearing me talk in this nerdy way, scholarly way, would you know that? You wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that my sister was adopted from Columbia, South America, when I was six. You wouldn't know that I love Rachel very deeply. You wouldn't know that I've experienced interesting things through her growing up in coastal Maine, her not having the same skin color as other people in our, in our school, in our community. Nothing, nothing terrible, thank God, but different experiences, absolutely. You wouldn't know that about me. You wouldn't know it when you see somebody who adopts multiple children of a different ethnicity, a different skin color. You wouldn't know that. I I have numerous friends. I have a fellow professor at Midwestern Seminary who's adopted three children who do not have his skin color. And he didn't do so to try to be some super white person out there saving the world. He did so because of the gospel, because these children were in need, and he loved them. He wanted to show that love expressively and sacrifice his own time and interest and comfort and all these. You don't know that about him when you see him, though. You look at him, you might think, I might think, stereotypical white person. But you don't know him. Wokeness is training us to stereotype others and even, pressing in, dislike and even hate others just based on how they look. And that is deeply unbiblical. I think of a now famous video, a viral video along these lines in a training session captured on video from 2017 
a, a teacher named Ashley Shackelford opposed racism in memorable fashion. She's standing in front of a group of women, predominantly white women, and she, she's uh, African-American, and she bluntly tells these women, all white people are racists. Probably 80% white, the room, so to speak, white in air quotes. And then she says this, not only are white people racists, but they have no real hope of change. Quote, no, you're always going to be racist, actually, even when you're on a path to be a better human being, mocking that kind of language, end quote. So white people are racist. They're always going to be racist. Even when they want to improve and want to grow, they can't, according to this session. You can find it on the internet in about 10 seconds. As if that wasn't a hard enough hit, she doubles down. I believe all white people are born into not being human. Well, that's a strong one right there. But she's got more. White people, according to Shackelford, grow up, and I quote, to be demons. It's actually a gender, according to the new gender guidelines. Dymo gender, dead serious. The, uh, close, a, a gender of the demonic or supernatural may have been experienced during lockdown, the blissful experience of lockdown these last, like, I think you might not be male or female, I think you might be dimo gender, bro, I don't know. Not actually arguing for that. Don't tweet me on that, okay, thank you. This is unusually strong water, but it is also strikingly honest. You always got to see where systems go when they're raw and authentic in their claims. Not just the airbrushed, polished material. When people let the tongue slip, when they really speak out what they think, and they represent a system, what do they say? White people grow up to be demons. Friends, again, every white person, so-called, needs Jesus infinitely. Every white person has failed has not just failed in a human sense, has failed God, is depraved, needs Christ infinitely. Every person does as well. There's not a separate category here. This system actually foments racism. Fifth, wokeness and intersectionality call evil what Scripture calls good and calls good what Scripture calls evil. A quote from the BLM website. We are committed to fostering a queer-affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that in all the world are homosexual or heterosexual, excuse me, unless he or she or they disclose otherwise. By the way, Living Waters has done some good videos along these lines. Talk to EZ, some of you know him doing really good work. Mark Spence, very thankful for the work they've done on BLM, exposing some of these things. All of these kind of materials, these quotes that I'm giving you, show us that there is a directly counter-biblical agenda in this movement. Christians definitely believe that every human life matters. People who have every skin color matter. That's the image of God. We believe that every person, not just we hope, will have a, a, a flourishing life on earth, but will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and live eternally. That is a very strong belief that every life matters. Image of God, we pray that we'll be changed by divine grace into the image of Christ. And yet, black lives matter as a group is deeply unbiblical and calls good what Scripture calls evil. Sixth, wokeness reads cultural events in search of its dominant narrative. What I mean here is that we look at complex events, sometimes on video, on social media, 20-second shaky video, and we jump, we leap to a conclusion about these events when it turns out in many cases that they're far more complex than we initially heard, and perhaps the mainstream media on CNN and MSNBC and other outlets led us to believe. Meanwhile, America is burning. Meanwhile, an African-American police chief is shot in the head while we sort out, oh, actually, these are the details of this video. Look, there can be real instances of police brutality 
We have a category for this. We believe in total depravity as biblical Christians, but we are also careful. We need to be careful. James 1, 19 to 20, does James say, be quick to speak and quick to anger? It's the opposite of what he says. It is nothing less than divine to be slow to speak and slow to anger. But please hear me. Our culture is calibrated the opposite way. It is calibrated to make you maximally angry and communicating at the speed of light because you've watched a 17 and a half second video. We have something called due process. It doesn't always work right, but it's a judicial system that is honestly God's common grace to us. And friends, as the church, we are aware of injustice. We are aware of real problems societally. We are aware of the epidemic of fatherlessness, and we need, we need to plunge in as salt and light, as was prayed here and mentioned here a few minutes ago. And yet, we also need to distinctly be the church by being slow to speak and slow to anger and quick to listen. What is it we're supposed to be? This is a, this is a challenge for us men speaking in the aggregate, if I may, for just a moment and be extreme, stereotype friendly here. It can be a challenge for us to listen, can't it? With the wifely unit to not jump to the solution. In my marriage, almost 15 years, how many times have I heard my wife say, I just need you to hear this before we dive into how to fix it. And I say, for roughly the Mm, what are we up to? 5,121st time. You're right. I'm listening. <laughs> Fraser Crane or something out here. So we need, to, we need to listen, but our culture isn't encouraging us to do that. There are real problems. There are real problems. There's sin run amok in this world. Are you kidding me? We have a category for social breakdown and cultural upheaval, but we have to sort this out biblically and through the gospel. That is not the way Twitter and Instagram are encouraging you to do things. Seventh, I'm going to go rapid fire here, almost done. Wokeness greatly complicates interracial membership of the, in the church, marriage, adoption, even friendship. Recently, Ibram Kendi, who I mentioned earlier, uh, commented on Twitter about a picture of Amy Coney Barrett, the new Supreme Court nominee, holding in her arms two African-American children. Coney uh, Barrett has adopted two children from Haiti, and her sister has adopted two African-American children as well. Uh, they're, they're Catholic. Uh, and Kendi said, some white colonizers, speaking in the past, adopted black children. They civilized these savage children in the superior ways of white people while using them as props in their lifelong pictures of denial. What is happening here? What, what was Kendi saying? Kendi is saying, when white people adopt black children, they are white colonizers. They're using these kids as props. Here again is one of those moments, friends. Please hear me. When you see a system showing itself, showing its true colors, you don't often get that. You get, you get a polished veneer. This is not a polished veneer. This is what is in the heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. A system grounded in hatred will produce hatred. When this woman, not an evangelical Christian from what I know, and her husband, in common grace terms, again, are simply trying to adopt a child and love the child, something my own parents did, something a number of you have done, something I'm sure is prevalent throughout Kindred and throughout other churches represented here, and praise God for it, and is no part of white colonization and using these kids as props. Do adoptive parents need the gospel and need forgiveness and need Jesus? Absolutely, we all do, but that is not a necessary sign of racism. This is upside-down thinking. Eighth, wokeness destabilizes truth, making it narratival rather than absolute. The technical term here is standpoint epistemology. Uh, very quickly, standpoint epistemology means that when you're underprivileged, like I was talking about in the intersectional section, when you are underprivileged, you can see truths then when you interpret or read a text that privileged peoples can't see because their privilege is blinding them. What this ends up meaning in like a university context, and I've heard about this in numerous 
evangelical schools now in 2020 is that you need to assign books, for example, in a theology class, not that are all grouped around common belief in the truth and that expounds sound doctrine. You need to first and foremost assign books from diverse writers. That is an outworking of standpoint epistemology. If you fail to do that, you're teaching Western imperialism. This is a deeply troubling and problematic trend. Lastly, finally, and we are done, donezo. Wokeness promotes in some a new system of associational unrighteousness and performative righteousness. Here it all coheres. We may become righteous in wokeness, not through justifying faith, grounded in the person and work of Jesus Christ, but by performing acts of cultural repentance, by becoming anti-racist. This is a works-based system. It's not that we shouldn't do righteousness. You've got a whole lot of Bible verses along those lines. It is that this system presents humanity with a different problem than the biblical one and thus leads humanity to a different solution than the biblical one. It is, of course, true that racists and ethnocentrists must repent of their sins. And it is true that the American past includes many who fell prey to these sins. We're not disputing that. We shouldn't dispute that. We shouldn't see history only in terms of one narrative. It's a very complex narrative. A ton of white people, so-called, died in the Civil War, for example. A lot of such people uh, uh, promoted the abolitionist cause in the 19th century. There's a lot more complexity to the narrative than is often said, and yet we also acknowledge racism and ethnocentrism must occasion repentance. But wokeness, please do not under, misunderstand, wokeness is not the gospel. Wokeness is a different gospel. It is a gospel of works. It is more a system of penance than of salvation. Wokeness, in the end, is not just a new variation on the gospel. Wokeness is not just a different way to be Christian. Wokeness is not just another gospel. Wokeness is anti-gospel. Brothers, as we conclude, flee wokeness. And you, as men who understand the times, in love, lead your family, your friends, church members, peers, neighbors, co-workers. A lot of you are under intense pressure in secular workplaces to embrace these kind of ideas. Lead them out. Don't let you or your loved ones be taken captive. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, for the grace to oppose this system, to destroy arguments as Paul prayed, as Paul said. Pray that you would give us grace and courage and that you would make disciples out of those who are buying into this system and think they are becoming righteous. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.